you only need to answer one question, which is not, do I hustle or do I chill or do I have the spirit or am I creative or whatever? It's have I answered the question is, can I reliably and repeatedly get customers? I think that's the most fundamental question to jump in that fence. Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Thanks for clicking the palm tree. Last week, everybody came out of the woodwork to send me a message, the texts, the emails, the Twitters. Everybody has an idea about what to do with their location. I love the feedback we got on last week's episode. We're definitely going to be speaking more about location. I came on the show last week to talk about my move back to America. This week, I'm going to tell you about going on the road for six months. Why not? We're all here for location freedom. Matthew tweets me. He says the paradox of... I want to move back to North America to grow my business so that it becomes successful enough to allow me to live in Asia when I want. Yeah, basically that. Like that, reverse it, flip it upside down, all that. It's endless, it's changing, it's exciting, it's cool. Personally, it's been awesome hearing from so many of you. So many personal notes, so many tweets like Daniel writes in to say, having lived abroad for 10 plus years, it takes a toll, especially with a family more passports to keep valid, more paperwork hassles. Living on a visa also starts to feel insecure. You realize if situations change, you could lose your home and lifestyle. It's that kind of like existential thing um, that doesn't really come up kind of in the first few years. So I think Daniel's pointing to that. Vincent writes to say, apart from the lower quality of life, USA always makes me feel insecure. What if I got cancer? What about medical insurance? What if someone attacks my kids at school. Unfortunately, you do have to think about those things if you live in America. So pretty interesting topic. Amazing to hear from all of you. So we're definitely going to do a reprise. So keep the thoughts coming in. I think the main takeaway is you want choice. I think that's why we're building these businesses. Speaking of choice, I'm choosing to pack up my podcast microphone and take it on the road this summer. There's so many amazing DC events through the rest of the year. We're going to be in Europe and we'll be traveling around to New York City, a couple conferences, and then to Asia for the remainder of the year. This is going to be full nomadi. Just looking forward to traveling again. So lots of stories from the road coming up down the pike here. We promised this week we'd get back to business. We decided we'd do that at the very top with the concept of the business idea. We challenged ourselves, how does one think of a business idea, whether you're just starting out or whether you want to pivot or improve your current business or start a side project? How do you develop and think about new ideas? Turns out there's a ton of frameworks out there. Wasn't fully satisfied with what we found, so we just kind of jumped into it and workshopped this episode. Turns out it's a much bigger, bigger topic than we conceived of. So you're going to hear a journey into this concept of business ideas today with Ian. First, some news. We received over 100 applications for our new DC community. We appreciate everyone who reached out to us. We are deep in the thick of speaking with so many seven and eight figure founders. In related news, we've actually been publishing some more information about our community, the DC, because, hey, we have a website now. That's a thing. Uh, We recently did a census of the community. And in 2023, you're much more likely to meet DCers who have kids. In fact, 40% of members have kids. A lot of us have over 10 full-time employees and a meaningful percentage of the group has over $1 million in revenue. So we've been talking a lot about that and what scale looks like and bringing those topics here to the show. We're also seeing a much larger percentage of female founders, which is one of the trends we're most excited about. 24% of the group is female founders. That was really cool to see much more larger businesses and growing families. So I don't know, check it out over at the blog, dynamitecircle.com. That's it. Today, we're talking about business ideas. I invited Ian onto the show to talk about some of our favorite frameworks, things that have worked, things that have not worked, and to explore how they can go to work for you. Let's roll it. All right, my first business idea. You're going to love this one, Ian. Write a book about business ideas because the horrible options on lay Googles right now and lay chat GPT 
terrible. No one has sat down to write a decent book about how one might generate business ideas. I think this is a great business idea. It's meta. It's a self-licking ice cream cone. Maybe we'll be the ones to do it along with the TMBA audience. We're going to talk about some favorite ways to develop business ideas. If you've got yours, email them to us. We'll compile the list and email it out in our newsletter. Sound like a deal, boss man? Reminds me of uh, last week when I was searching uh, how to have sex. Not a lot of good books on that either, <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> okay, so, so I mean, we're starting off on a roll here. It's really a dual opportunity. Might not be the same author, but yeah, I, I think there's some holes in the market. Ian, I know we're getting obsessed about accounting and tracking every single dollar in the business. So I'm going to get ahead of this one and tell you that I spent $7.99 on a horrible book on Amazon called The Business Idea Factory. Let me read a small excerpt for you. If you want to have a business idea, take a water glass and fill it with clean, but not boiled water. Don't boil it. This is critical to the ultimate business success. With both hands, take the glass, close your eyes, and look upward at a 45-degree angle. In fact, Ian, I know you have a Waterloo on the desk. Let's do this together. Formulate a task that you need to solve as a question, then drink half of the glass of water while thinking, this is all I need to find the solution to the problem I have in mind. Mm. Okay. Now, I'm actually drinking eyes. a uh, tapache. I think that's how you say it. I'm off the water loose, but I get what you're after. Is that Continue direct on. from Native Americans? What? what? What is it? Uh, it's trash. Contains six percent juice. I mean, it's Squanto's water. Yeah, <laughs> it's, not, it's not even farm to table anymore. It's indigenous to table. That's what we demand. Oh, open your okay. No, we're not even done with our business idea um, exercise here from the business idea factory. Now, open your eyes. Put the glass of water near the bed and go to sleep without talking to anyone. In most cases you will receive an answer while you sleep in the form of a hint, insight, or partial idea. I mean, this is brilliant. Wow. This is absolutely brilliant. Does this lead to some kind of coaching program? I want to remind everybody following along at home, looking for their big business breakthrough, don't boil that water. Make sure it's not boiled. Or <laughs> okay, so this is your competition. My first business idea, go write a book about how to have a business idea. I want to preface the conversation with Two kind of concepts. One is one that Ian and I have been talking about for a very long time. We used to do episodes called Business Idea Donations. We get over 100 comments on them where people love to talk about business ideas. But we would often talk about this thing called the business idea paradox, which is that if you think you need a business idea, if that's what's standing between you and business, you probably don't. That's the paradox. And then if you have a business, you probably have more ideas than you know what to do with, therefore the business idea donations. So a bit of a paradox that people just getting started in business often think that it's sort of an idea that's standing between them and the seven-figure lifestyle business that they're dreaming about. Well, I know that's not super satisfying because what we really want is business ideas. So I try to take it a step forward. What do you do with this information? Well, number one, you can say hustle and execute and all the things that don't involve ideas, but involve behavior and action. Okay, those things are hard. What about this? Find a channel, not an idea. So forget about business ideas. Think about a channel, not an idea. What's the hypothesis here? We obviously have look at hundreds of businesses on an annual basis. And for, I would say for about nine out of 10 businesses that are below $10 million is typically what we're looking at. The hardest problem that that business has solved, if it's a good business, the kind that you're like, oh yeah, that's a good business. It's not a, typically not a product problem. It's a marketing problem. It's a channel problem. If you look at businesses that are struggling, entrepreneurs that are, have a shiny object syndrome, they feel like they're not in the right space. It's typically because they don't have a repeatable marketing channel defined. Here's a pretty basic example, right? To my right here, I have this really cool notebook. I bought it in Bangkok. It's a Japanese notebook. It has a plastic ring binder that makes it like lay down nicely. And it's this great product. I want to buy more of these products. It's a really cool product. Now, a lot of people, when they're trying to have a business idea, they'll say, 
hey, I need to have my version of the notebook. I need to figure out what's different about my product than other products and build that up. And then I'll go out there and sell it. Now, that's one option. You have the notebook with the cool feature. That's having a business idea. That's having a product. Now, the other situation you could find yourself in is you could have yourself a way of accessing people who love buying notebooks. That's your other option. Now, what's the harder problem to solve? You have the notebook and you need to find people to buy it, or you have the buyers and you need to make the notebook. Nine times out of 10 for businesses less than 10 million revenue, the kinds of businesses that are listening to this show, the much harder problem to solve is finding the buyers. It's extremely expensive. It is the root of so much business failure. You might start a business because you know a few buyers, but you don't know how to find more, right? Or you're a buyer, but you don't know how to repeat how you became a buyer and how to duplicate that out there in the world. So my idea here is to start writing down channels that you know about where buyers hang out. The most common one is events and personal relationships. But that's not that sexy, not that fun or scalable or repeatable. So let's put that on the shelf for a minute. Let's start writing down different ways you know about how to find buyers. It could be communities on the web. It could be marketing tactics that you heard about at a conference that are really interesting that aren't employed in your industry yet. It could be a new social platform that doesn't have a bunch of users yet. It could be a sales technique that's really popular in a competitive industry that's not being yet used in a less competitive industry. It could be a geographical thing where it's really happening. There's buyers that are getting served in one market, but not in another market. And so there's a bunch of ways you can think about channels. In fact, there's a book called Traction, not the Geno Wickham Traction, but another Traction that talks about all the different channels that you can explore to build a business with. The final say it like this, like the way you can visualize what I'm trying to talk about is, do you ever see those cave paintings where there's like stick men and like the private parts are really big? You ever hear about this? Like back in the day, oh, like yeah. these ancient people. This is how I draw as well. Yeah. yeah. They're like little kids. It'll be like the private parts are big. The heads are big. It's like representing what's important to them, you know? And so for most of the listeners of this show, if you were to represent what's important in the business, the channel would be the private part. It would be the big thing. It would be the part that you're most focused on because that is really the nut you need to crack. (laughs) All right. Literally. That's a nut you need to crack in order to build the sort of business that people will start to call like an asset, repeatable, sellable. It's all in the channel, baby. Dan, when you're describing this to me, I'm thinking about a couple different businesses and different business types. I think this is in a lot of ways like why consulting is so attractive is because basically it's a high ticket item and you don't need to have that many customers. So your channel doesn't need to be that big. It's like, hey, I do really well at my job. If I just start consulting for other companies like my job, I actually know three of them because we have clients that I could probably sign on with right away. Then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm a business quote business owner. And for a lot of people, that's just kind of where it scales to. It's like, oh, yeah, I've got three clients. I make the same amount that I did at my job, but I have a lot more freedom. And then they start to think about their offering and they're like, well, wouldn't it be great if I had 20 clients or 50 clients or 100 clients? And then it starts to break down from there because it's like, well, no, wait a second. Now the economics don't make sense. Wait a second. It's actually really hard to find 100 companies that do this type of aerospace engineering consulting, whatever it is. And so it breaks down. And so you know, during this conversation, I think it will be interesting for me, especially to kind of figure out like the difference between like a business and just like making money, and, like what those opportunities look like. The other thing that comes to mind when you're mentioning channels is um, you know, like back in the day, there was like a town, an old Western town, I'm imagining. And you needed certain goods, like you needed shoes, you needed candles, you needed clothes. And people just kind of set up shop according to Hollywood. Bring me to that town, Ian. Yeah. People just set up shop. Okay. And uh, they started selling their goods and their wares. And that's kind of like where it ended. It was just like, that's Well, the it. channel was Main Street, if you're... Exactly. The yeah. channel was Main Street, but they could almost start with the goods because the demand was there. They looked around and realized that nobody had a good pair of shoes. And that was kind of it. And so I think now with the advent of the internet, 
here in 2023, like you said, the problem has changed. The problem has flipped. One in 10 people can come up with a good product and it's so good that the channels kind of build themselves. But for most of us, we have platforms like Amazon now where they've like figured out the channel problem for you. And then you bring your product on there. And then now we're seeing all these people have to get good at marketing. Yeah, like FBA, like it basically made the channel challenge more legible, right? And and that's where like, you know, these jungle scouts and the AMZ trackers of the world came along and said, hey, we're a tool to like solve this channel problem, which you're right. You know, it's basically like an old West town with a main street. And now that main street is just duplicated in Reddit sub forums and on TikTok and on Instagram and on YouTube and on cold call, all these different things. So yeah, but to answer your question, we were talking about making money versus having a business. I wrote down this, Ian, there is a fence. There's a fence in Ian's town. And on one side, there's entrepreneurs. And on the other side, there's everyone else. And how do you draw the fence? On the one side, to jump the fence, you only need to answer one question, which is not, do I hustle or do I chill or do I have the spirit or am I creative or whatever? It's have I answered the question is, can I reliably and repeatedly get customers? I think that's the most fundamental question to jump in that fence. One of the other things, if you're going to start to make your list of channels, like different ways you could access and find buyers, the next step is to think about wedges and edges. How can you get into the door? How can you have a differentiated message? What's your unfair advantage? We call those things wedges often or edges. Like what can you do that other people in the space are unwilling to do? What can you say that they're not going to say or not capable of saying? Those are all things you can do to, you know, after you've identified that channel, start to build up a group of buyers that could ultimately be what you base your business on. All right, I got another one for you here, Ian. So the first one is uh, find a channel, not an idea. Uh, the second one, I'll call it a uh, classic brainstorming. A little bit of classic brainstorming, which will involve two of my favorite things, a whiteboard and a Venn diagram. Of course, you could do this on uh, Miro or whatever your favorite online. By the way, just a little tool shout out. Mural and Miro. Do you, do you use these, Ian? Miro, M-I-R-O. Miro. Or and mural. what's the one that we use for coaching? Mural. I think it's called Miro. M-I-R-O. Miro. Yeah, it's Miro. Miro is like the newest $20 billion valuation company that I'm sure will be a half a million dollars 10 years from now. Yeah. Oh, ouch. Continue. I love this software. Right now, I'm, I'm looking at a 27-inch screen. And a lot of the things, as are the ideas that you think about in business, they're hard to visualize unless you're actually like whiteboarding them. And so if you don't have a whiteboard handy because you're traveling around, these pieces of software can absolutely do wonders as we do our coaching process. For me, I'm always using it for things like mapping out the organization or the cash flows. It just, language doesn't do it for me. I need to like see who's where and like how much kind of asset or value or money is related to that person, how much is going in, how much is going out, like to basically create a schematic of an organization. These are super interesting. Okay, so the schematic we're talking about today is not an org chart or an industry survey. It is a Venn diagram. Of course, we all know uh, Venn diagrams are from Thailand, ancient Eastern practice. What you do is you take... That is not true, by the way. (laughs) You take three circles. Hold up a second. I'm on a roll here. You take three circles and you put them on your whiteboard or your mirror board. And this is a classic one. I remember this back in the early days. You put your passions in one, you put your strengths in another, and then you put market demand on a third. And I think this is really interesting. The market demand one, I think, is is the hardest one. The passions, you know, what are you passionate about doing? What are you strong at? And what's the market demand? The interesting thing is like if you miss one of the three in your business idea, you're likely to be in a tough spot. Like if you have just strength and passion but no market demand, you're an artisan, which can be cool, but like it's not going to lead necessarily to the seven-figure lifestyle business if you're just good at it and you like it. You know, there's a lot of things that I'm good at and that I like jamming on my guitar at night, but there's certainly no market demand for someone to watch me jam on my guitar at night. This is an example of two things meeting, but one missing. 
So another example of two things um, meeting up with each other, but missing the third market demand and passion meeting each other that might equal a uh, dreamer. I yeah. think we've all been here before. This is a uh, sign my NDA guy has like the all the market demand ideas and all the passion, but like doesn't know how to execute on it whatsoever. Like I've got an idea for a new dating app. Like, yeah, there's demand for oh, a new yeah. dating app. I've got like a ton of passion for connecting people. Did you ever hear like just just breakfast or whatever? Like this one's called like just afternoon tea time. And I'm really sure I'm passionate about it because breakfast is too early to like have romance and it needs to be at least early afternoon. Plus, you can still go on another date at night. Whatever. Tons of passion, but just no strength whatsoever. So I'm going to need you to sign my NDA and not take my idea. Final one is um, market demand with strength. So you lack passion. Generally speaking, I call this the intersection of PE firm. This is the <laughs> definition of a PE firm here. Cocaine habit, we wrote down. Yeah. Or it, also, like, ironically enough, idea guy. Like, hey, I got an idea. Like, this is a person who has a new idea every other week and just basically isn't passionate about the product or the marketplace or the buyers. And so, yeah. Obviously, the point of the whiteboard exercise or this ancient tie exercise is to find something in the middle. That's what we're all talking about. That's like entrepreneurial nirvana. Nirvana yeah. is a good example of this, right? Passion, strength, market demand. Yes, there was four years where that was the case and it worked out very well for <laughs> so them. It was four good years. <laughs> <laughs> and then the cocaine. <laughs> but uh, I think if you're going to choose one circle to focus on, I would say market demand. You know, that's the leg in the stool that you don't want to be missing. And I think it's sort of undervalued by a lot of prospective and current entrepreneurs is market demand. I've met a lot of highly successful, some of the most fulfilled founders that I personally know don't participate in markets that they were necessarily like the number one avatar for. Like, I'm so passionate about comic books and I sell comic books or whatever. But rather, people who got really solid feedback from the market in terms of demand and then built up their strengths to serve the market and found a passion in growing an excellent organization around that demand. So sometimes I think people skew too heavily to the passions and the strengths and not enough towards the market demand. That's typically what I see. As founders of remote companies, we all face hiring challenges like hiring today instead of next week or next quarter, scaling our teams quickly, and even just defining what we want in a candidate, where to find them, how much to pay them, and how to recruit them. There's a lot of questions. Hiring's complicated, but it doesn't need to be with RemoteFirstRecruiting.com. It's a service from our team where we help founders like you solve these hiring hangups. Even if you're not hiring today, you gotta take advantage of our 15-minute free strategy call. It's with our senior recruiter, Greg Valentine. He's not a sales guy. He's a senior recruiter, industry expert, and he's helped place hundreds of remote candidates and companies just like yours. He can discuss with you the patterns we're seeing in the marketplace, share with you case studies, and talk about how you can build a rock solid hiring strategy. Hiring doesn't need to be hard. Let our team do the heavy lifting. TMBA listeners, take advantage of this strategy call. It's a simple way to grow a better business. So head on over to our site, remotefirstrecruiting.com, where we believe hiring the right talent is the best way to grow a great remote business. Schedule a call with our team today at remotefirstrecruiting.com. All right, here's another one for you, Ian. And I'll just be a little Twitter triggery. Ask if it can be done by Filipinos. Um, oh boy. I know who you've been reading too much of. I read, I read, <laughs> I read Sweaty Startups tweets. He's hilarious. All he's doing is trying to trigger everybody. It works. You know, at first I was like, ha ha, sweaty startup, you're the most hilarious Twitter person. Everybody's so angry at you. And then I got angry when he started making fun of people with the green bubble the Android users, because I've been ostracized from many of friendship groups because I'm the Android user. That's true. And I completely got blindsided by it. 
because I lived outside of the United States where these sorts of status games were not being played. I don't know what kind of jeans you guys wear or what kind of telephones you have. Uh, I was just using the best operating system. (laughs) I remember one conversation. I asked everybody at the table if they were the only ones that texted you over WhatsApp in their life. And they all said yes. But you insist like everybody use WhatsApp, you know? Uh, Uh And so we got a real answer there. But asking if it can be done by Filipinos for me is like basically the same question we're asking ourselves, Dan, nearly 15 years ago, which is, can it be made in China? You and I were walking around 15 years ago with a passion for designing products, strength of manufacturing resources in China, and no market demand. So going against (laughs) what we just advocated for, essentially, which is like, we didn't know who we were going to sell these products to. But like this was a version of our arbitrage. At the time, it's hard to believe, but like even 15 years ago, it was still a relevant question, which was like, is anybody making this in China yet? Which basically means is like, is there an opportunity to like make margin on this product? Yeah. And so your question about like asking if it can be done by Filipinos is essentially the same question, which is like, has this job been outsourced overseas yet? Yeah. It's like basically like if you have a framework that's more operationally efficient, there's your margin to like solve the audience problem potentially. Also, if it's an incumbent product with an inefficient delivery mechanism, there's the demand. You can sort of see the demand in the marketplace. Now, that can be a tricky game because you don't always know if you can, how much you can participate in that demand or necessarily what the story is, is how that came about. But it's an interesting thing to try to dissect and see if you can play a role in that. I, I wrote down some other ones here, like, is it done by AI yet? How about accountants or professionals in Latin America? You know, instead of like everybody has an accountant in North America, why don't we get one in Latin America now? There's a meaningful arbitrage there. There's an operational efficiency, architects in Asia, doctors in India. There's all different kinds of ways you can say like, I know how to deliver something 10x cheaper, half the price, whatever. This is like classic, you know, you go to get your MBA, they teach you this stuff. You know, pricing power is is a business move. Dan, I think there's like some troubles though with this method too which is basically like the arbitrage only lasts so long. So like you're seeing this like happen with like AI right now. It's like, is, is it powered by AI? Is it being done in AI, right? And I think like if you can get yourself in early enough with like the, can it be done by Filipinos or is it made in China yet? Or is AI doing it? You can like build yourself basically an audience or a marketing channel, right? To a deliver brand. whatever product, yeah, yeah, a brand. And then from there, you can start to sell more expensive products that you have their attention, or you can figure out a more meaningful way to like deliver value for these people. But my like concern with like this approach, this like arbitrage, buy it for $15, sell it for 15 until everybody basically figures out that they don't have complete information is that it doesn't last very long. You can do this with online publishing too, whether it's a Twitter account or a newsletter or a podcast where you're willing to like, as an individual, because you're willing to live somewhere cheap or use some of your savings, basically produce better content than the incumbent publishers do. That's like a kind of a way that creatives use the same exact principle, which is like, I'll be more operationally efficient because I'll take all these fancy new smart drugs and I'll just write eight hours a day and I'll be way better than the incumbents. So that's another example of this. I got another one for you, Ian. How about this? I'm going to borrow this from friend of the show, Tommy Griffith. Make it incredibly difficult and pointless and complicated. All right, what do I mean? (laughs) What do I mean by this? Okay, so the idea is there's this meme and it's basically like the dumb people and the smart people, the geniuses do the same thing and then everybody in the middle is like making it complicated and difficult, okay? And this is, I completely relate to this because I am solidly in the middle, mediocre category. So... The example he gave was starting a business. You need an idea, right? The dumb people just make something people want. And the geniuses just make something people want. But how does this cash out for entrepreneurs? Well, a lot of times it's the thing we have resistance to. It's the duh business idea. I once heard, I just, I loved this. There was this kind of jazz guitarist who went to Berkeley School of Music was just so angry that John Mayer is rich and famous, you know? And the critique was, John Mayer, every song is just, duh. It's like, it was the song that needed to be written because it's the song that people wanted to jam at the beach on the weekend. And that is just way below a jazz guitarist. And 
The answer is why why be the jazz guitarist? Just be duh. Play the four chord power chord. Write the summer anthem. Give them what they want. I love the fact that she brought up John Mayer because we're both fans, but for I think probably different reasons. But the reason I think John Mayer is genius is because he writes the duh songs, but then if you go watch him on YouTube, he does the exact opposite when he jams out with bands and on his own. He's like a, an exceptional guitarist. So like he understands the de market demand for his skill set and he packages it in a very intelligent way. And then he goes off and lives his passion and probably smokes the guy that you were talking about when it comes to picking the guitar. I'll tell you what John Mayer is not listening to at the pool on the weekends. John Mayer hits. Okay? Exactly. He's, John Mayer's listening to the jazz <laughs> shit, man. <laughs> Well, one of the ways this often manifests in listeners of the show is that there's like this very obvious way to make money based on your skill set or your, your strengths, your passions, but you're blocked from it because it wasn't in the four hour work week, man, or whatever, right? It's not an ebook. It's not scalable. It's not scalable. If it's not scalable, we won't do it. And we have a block towards that. And I think that's the most common way that this manifests is not being willing to make the money that's right in front of you because it's, quote, not scalable. And so if you have like an emotional, or that it echoes too much of your career, it's like, oh man, I used to get paid woof, a ton of money to be a doctor. I just cannot get paid to be a doctor anymore. That's too much money, right? It kind of, it's that kind of thing where it, it echoes too much of something that doesn't look like the ideal ebook on a beach scalable model. Well, the problem is, is that model that you're dreaming of we do the exercise at the top of the episode, do the channel exercise, figure out how much it'll cost to acquire those buyers. And it might not look so attractive, right? Selling hundred dollar eBooks looks great until you figure out how much it costs you to find the buyers of the eBook. And when you look at that number, you might say, doctoring looks pretty good right now, at least until I can cash for myself, build my skill set, and work my way into a more scalable business model. Scaling in the early days is a big problem. Leads me to my next one, it's a poker term, boss man. It's called polarize your range. Polarize, what's polarizing your range mean? You know it on gamble, unless it's with emotions. I so swear, go ahead man, and tell me. I'm going to be triggered as hell if you call poker gambling. Poker's a game of skill. There's betting. It's not gambling. Here we go. <laughs> All right. We're going to circle back to our good friend, Nick Huber from Sweaty Startup. He tweets the other day, this is right on the heels of the Android tweet. I barely want to look at his tweets, but then he tweets this or he totally redeems himself. He says, if you aren't rich, every single business you start needs to be cash flow positive within two weeks. If it isn't, go get a job working for somebody who knows how to make money or a rich person with a big idea. Sounds silly, but this is why most people fail poor early decisions. It isn't your job as a non-rich person to change the world with your big idea. If you want to change the world, it's your job to get rich and then go about doing that however you want. Harsh, but true. I actually don't even think this is harsh. In some ways, I think Nick is summing up the point of like the Tropical MBA ethos in regards to business ideas, which is cash flow your way. Right what we were talking about before, if you're talking about scalability while you're still trying to cover your rent with your entrepreneurial income, you got things backwards, man. I like Nick's approach, which is, Build up your cash flow, build up your wealth and agency, get a repeatable pool of buyers from a channel that you've established, and then change the world, right? Get it right. Get the sequence right. What we see is the end product on the web, and we want to emulate that. And I think what Nick's pointing to, and it's becoming more transparent over the years, is the actual path that this stuff takes. I love the basic heuristic. Do not do it if you can't put a price tag on it within a couple of weeks. I love that. I'll agree and disagree, Dan. Uh, I agree with most of this tweet. First sentence, if you aren't rich, every single business you start needs to be cash flow positive within two weeks. I think the idea here is basically don't lock yourself in a closet for six months with your great idea and then present it to the market and have it flop because that's terribly risky. But there is a distinction between like poor, have some money, rich, wealthy. I do think there's like a spectrum in there. If you have a runway, which is basically like if you have a couple weeks, days, months, whatever it is where you can survive 
you're doing market testing, you're getting feedback, you're like presenting a business or a product to people and things are going well. I think that you can give yourself a little bit more than two weeks a lot of times. Because like I think some things take a little bit longer to come together. So I think what's important though is like feedback. You can't work by yourself. So maybe give yourself a little bit more than two weeks to be cash flow positive, but like you need positive feedback within those first two weeks to know if you're working in the right direction. Mm. And these can't be like false indicators. These can't be your friends. These need to be actual people that you're asking for money to give you feedback. Remind me after this call, I'm going to pitch you on my new dating app idea. Oh we'll boy. If, uh, but I forgot. I want to tie this back into polarizing your range. What's this poker stuff all about? Do I got to work it in? Yeah, I got to work it in. I think polarized range are interesting. Actually, it's represented on the previous point that uh, the dumb people do the same thing as the geniuses do. And everybody else is caught in the middle. That's the polarity is like on the edges, the behavior looks similar. It's similar in poker, actually, which is the very, if you have aces, you play that very similarly as if you have garbage. Because if you have a mid-range hand, you're sort of betting for value. You behave differently. Where say you're putting money in the middle, hoping to get the best hand. And by the river card, which is the last card in, in Hold'em Poker, you missed it, right? You had a 25% chance of hitting it and you missed it. You might bet like you hit it. You'd never bet in the middle for value. You'd bet big like you hit it. That's the polarized range. So what does it mean in the case of this idea that you would put a price tag on something within two weeks? Well, you could do the exact opposite, which is don't get caught in the middle with some dating app that's going to take six months to build and you got to move to San Francisco and do all this kind of random stuff. What about just absolutely screwing around and doing something super cool? Take some time, go explore something. It doesn't even need to be business related. It could just be something that you're incredibly passionate about. I think that that's a way you can polarize your range here. You can say, you know what? Screw business. Screw the price tag. I'm just going to go do something that I believe in. I think that that's another way you can polarize this range and kind of get some traction. Just go dig in, get nuts with it. Because what happens if you're trying to make something with commercial potential and you're in the middle, you're trying to serve too many masters at once. You're not really that passionate about it. And you don't get that market feedback that Nick's talking about. So I say polarize your range. Think about polarities and a lot of different strategies in your business and life. I know, Ian, this has been a long, toilsome episode. So I thought I would uh, introduce a new segment to the show. We call it Break Time on the Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Uh-oh. So take a moment, hose yourself down. And what I want to do is uh, talk about some business ideas of days younger. Of course, the Boulevard of Broken Dreams is your domain registrar account. So I encourage every listener now, if you want to have a good laugh, log into your domain registrar and check out all the amazing business ideas that you've had over the years. Just By the way, uh, business ideas, obviously to be confused with domains. It's like, always start with the logo and the domain. Details, details, details. Let's talk about some of Ian's best business ideas of all time. How about this one, Ian? Replacement-motorcycle-fairings.com. I spent 30 days of my life in China in, in one hotel room for this idea. And I ate cheese pizza every single night down at the cafeteria. It was an interesting time for me. Oh my God, we have so many here. Uh... I don't even remember what half of these are. Inside guide travel info would probably be popular on Twitter right now, uh, given the everything guy Twitter yes. approach. Yeah. Yes. Just a little too early for your time there. How about this one? MakeMoneyOnlineGuy.com. Again, wildly popular here in 2023, mm -hmm. I bet. Especially if you use like a cartoon face instead of your own face. That's right. If you think that's too uh, lowbrow for you, how about this one, boss man? Expatperspectives.com. Mm, classy. Mm. Here's one I got under my hat that I refuse to get rid of the auto cancellation on. DynamiteRetreats.com. I still oh. think this business idea has legs. In fact, I've seen a few listeners kind of percolate on something similar. Here's the concept. Let me pitch it to you. This is you not letting go about it. We still have to talk about it. Okay. 
for the listeners out there, this might be the first time for me. It's like four years in. So go ahead. Come on, speak this to is them. this is an ideas show, man. We gotta let them flow. Here's the idea. I bet you probably want to go on a retreat with your team, your amazing team. And uh-huh. I think like the kind of logistics of like renting a space and flying there are kind of commodified. But what's not is like the content and what you do and why it matters to your organization. So here's the idea. It's just a type form. It hangs out at dynamiteretreats.com or whatever. And the idea is empowering remote, you know, making remote teams great again. Okay, that's the pitch line. You go to the, it's just a type form that takes like seven to 10 minutes to fill out where you tell me your team size, what time zone, you know, passports that the team has, and then the key challenges you're facing, what systems you're on, whether it's traction or scaling up or all this kind of stuff. And then you come back with different options for where they could go at what price points with what kinds of activities, mix of business, mix of fun, and you take your margin on it. DynamiteRetreats.com, baby. Get at me if you want to do that business. It's a great business. I can't believe I'm even asking for feedback. What a great business idea. Anybody uh, that wants to email me and uh, slip me $100 in my PayPal account, I will give you the login to our old GoDaddy <laughs> account and you could just go wild. Just transfer everything. All right. Let's see. There's a couple others here before we get moving. Let's see. What do we got here? There's some deeply embarrassing ones I don't even want to read. Oh, yeah. There's one called Boing, 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 Boing. Uh, Rover Reader, the IndieMBA.com. I think that's already taken. Velo España. <laughs> MobileMoneyMentors.com. Oh, my goodness. This is horrible. MacroniFairings.com. Yeah, of course. Uh, got some cool ones. RemoteSalaryCalculator.com. I'm not one to get rid of that just yet. Thank you. There's people that make real money doing this stuff. One of the guys that I follow on Twitter, I'd actually like to meet him one day. He seems like an interesting guy. Peter Askew, he buys and sells domains and uh, he figures out ways to monetize weird domain names. So I, I think it's kind of cool to like take this boulevard of broken dreams and give it to someone and see if they can actually monetize it. I think uh, a couple other guys do this as well. It's like an easier version of the business idea where people come over to your garage and they like put everything up on next door and Craigslist for you, basically. Totally. Except your garage is a boulevard of broken dreams. Yep. You know, we've been talking for a long time and only got halfway through our notes. I think it calls for a two-parter. Yeah, man. I think coming up with a business idea is complicated and easy at the same time. I think uh, the way that you described it is uh, really good, which is like you have the not so smart people on the left and then the really smart people on the right and then me and you, and I'm not going to mention how many of the (laughs) listeners of the show are in the middle. We just make everything so damn complicated. Yeah, I think a lot of us fall into this center section and we make it really hard on ourselves. Spend years and years trying to come up with, quote, good business ideas. When what we really want to do is meet a certain living requirement, certain income level, achieve certain things in our lives and other people's lives around us. And I think business is ultimately like an amazing way to accomplish these things. And so the question I am leaving myself with is, do you actually have to have a great business idea from the start to be able to do that? Or do you just need to start somewhere and then gradually inch towards your dreams? Yep. Simple is not easy. We'll piggyback on that and bring you back to the dating app pitch that I always suffered through this week, Ian. You know, the reason that I know this dating app is for sure not going to happen and the complicated thing at all of this is that there was too much ego in it. And that's sometimes where us in the middle, sometimes the geniuses and the people that aren't so smart, they're not all caught up by the promise of what a business can do for them. And the fact that I need to do something in order to make all of this happen for myself, for my family, it because of the incredible benefits you get, that's what you're going to get. Then it's about you, you, you. I'm going to hustle. I'm going to work. Me, me, me. And I was listening to this pitch, man. I'm like, this is too much about what this person wants and not enough about give the people what they want. That's all it takes. That's what the geniuses do. And uh, I guess that's the theme of this episode. Just give the people what they want, man. And then you know what you can do after you give the people what you want, what they want? Then you can do one for you. That's what they say. One for them, one for you, right? Then, then you can you rip on, on your guitar. You can play that jazz or blues. I can start whatever band I want and there can be 15 people in there and guess who's paying the bar owner? Me, because I, I made the money from giving the people what they want. That's, you can do whatever you want if you give the people what they want. You could start your charity. 
And guess what? You could even do a dating app. You could even, if your mission in the world is to connect more lovers, connect people, create more romance, if that's what you want to do, then you can do it. If you give the people what they want in the first thing. All right, that's it for this week. See you next week, man. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.